Welcome back to Southern Ghost Stories. I'm your host, the American Haunt Storian, Alan Searcy. So two weeks ago, I did two podcasts on some old ghost stories in Philadelphia. Uh, If you enjoyed them, please check out my book, Southern Ghost Stories Philadelphia. There's lots of great stories in the city of brotherly love. So today, I'm going to do something similar, but this time I'm headed to St. Louis to tell you about some fun folklore in the gateway to the West. In the early 1890s, Something strange was taking place in St. Louis, Missouri. Eerie occurrences were reported at Crevecore Lake. On August 15, 1892, the St. Louis Globe Democrat posted an article detailing numerous eyewitnesses' accounts about mysterious phenomenon that took place on the lake after the sun went down. Numerous people claimed to have seen what can only be described as a demon lurking in the depths of the lake. According to witnesses, The supernatural creature manifested in the water around midnight and seemed to be drawn to young couples who had snuck away to spend time together. Its arrival would startle the lovers as a demon would begin to stalk them. But abruptly, the creature would swim away and unleash its wrath by thrashing violently in the water that caused a foam to materialize on the lake's surface. One night, Caleb Jackson, an older African-American gentleman, saw the creature. As he observed it swimming across the lake, it ventured into a secluded cove. Yet, as it swam away, the water in its way began to bubble and churn, almost as if it was boiling. Word spread, and a reporter sought out Mr. Jackson to ask him about what he had seen. Mr. Jackson was reluctant, but the old man shared a story passed down through generations and told the young journalist about the origins of the demon as it had been told to him by his grandfather when he was a child. According to local lore, in the late 1700s, an Indian tribe lived and hunted at the edge of the lake. During that time, the tribe's chief had a beautiful young daughter who was courted by every native in their village. One day, a delegation of Frenchmen from the Louisiana Territory came into the area to broker a priest treaty with the chief. After the group met, the natives prepared a giant feast to celebrate peace between the two parties. During the celebration, the son of the governor broke away and took a walk around the lake with the chief's daughter. The young princess was smitten. Though he was odd, there is something about the charismatic, handsome white stranger who promised to come back for her after their diplomatic mission was completed. The young girl did her best to stay in contact with the Frenchman and waited for him to return. Sadly, once the governor learned of his son's intention to marry a girl that he considered to be a savage, he strictly forbid him from being with her. Within a few weeks, the governor arranged for his son to marry the daughter of an honorable family in the area. Days turned to weeks, weeks turned into months, and after a while the princess realized the Frenchman wasn't coming back for her. Late one night, she climbed onto a bluff and jumped into the lake and was never seen again. The next morning, the chief discovered his daughter's absence. Gripped by worry that she had been abducted, he ordered everyone in their tribe out of their tent and instructed them to line up by the lake. As he interrogated everyone, no one claimed to have seen his daughter. However, after a few moments, a wise elderly woman stepped forward and told the chief that his daughter had confided in her that she was in love with the governor's son and she didn't want to live if she couldn't be without with him. Consumed by grief, the chief instructed one of his braves to fetch a canoe and paddle him to the center of the lake. The heartbreak chieftain cried out to the great spirits and implored them to cast a curse upon the land. Consumed by the sorrow and anger at the way his daughter had ended her life, the chief commanded that her spirit not be allowed to access the realm of the great spirits. He commanded them to punish her and transform his daughter into a lonely demon. The tragic story of the young princess would stand as a cautionary tale, warning other young women in the tribe from getting involved with deceitful, fair-skinned men. Ever since that fateful day, the princess has been condemned to a sad, lonely existence in the lake. She remains forever deprived of the warm embrace of true love, yet her longing for it draws her close to young lovers who come to the lake. 
Eventually, her anger will consume her, and the tranquil lake will start to convulse and churn with torment. After the prince's death, some fur traders heard the story from the natives and started calling the lake Creve Coeur. When translated to English, the phrase means heartbreak. Today, the lake may or may not still be cursed, but the name rooted heartbreak has stuck for over 200 years. So here's another story, but it's not quite as sad. It's actually a true story that I found in an old newspaper about a girl who grew up in St. Louis. Unlike other girls her age in the neighborhood, Lizzie Hinkey had little interest in doing household chores or reading books in the parlor. Instead, she liked to go outside and sit atop the swinging gate in front of her house. What began as a source of amusement for her and the family, it soon became a cause of concern, as Lizzie would spend countless hours riding the gate door, going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. She did it for hours at a time. Eventually, Lizzie's father, Anton Hinky, decided he had seen enough, and he forbid her from swinging on the gate. But Lizzie, she was quite stubborn and refused to listen to her father. Every evening, she'd, they'd find her on the gate swinging back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. One afternoon, as Lizzie's mother was making some bread, her mischievous brother Joe had an idea. Armed with a bed sheet, he grabbed some of the dough his mother was making and he smeared it all over his face. Joe went outside and quietly approached Lizzie from behind as she rocked back and forth on the gate. He made a low, guttural sound as he jumped out to scare her. Lizzie fell off the gate and was scared out of her wits. Startled, Lizzie let out a piercing scream and quickly ran back into the house. She darted past her brother who had ditched the dough in the bedsheet and she hid all night in her room. From that day forward, Lizzie stopped swinging on the gate and believed her front yard was haunted. She only went outside when she had to, and she was always apprehensive and on guard any time she went anywhere near the gate. Sometimes, like all brothers would do, Joe would play tricks on her. He liked to sneak into her room and hide under her bed, and he'd make that same low, guttural sound just to scare her and freak her out. So, since the last episode... I had a few questions trickled in on social media. And one I got that I kind of wanted to dig into, uh, Philip Egger sent it to me. And he was asking me if there's any good Benjamin Franklin ghost stories in Philadelphia. Uh, well, thanks for the message, uh, Philip. Uh, this, there's actually one pretty well-known one up there in Philly. Franklin is buried in the northwest corner of the Christchurch Burying Ground in downtown Philadelphia. And you know the old quote, a penny saved is a penny earned. Well, it struck a chord with brides in the mid-1800s. Young ladies on their way to get married began placing pennies on Franklin's grave and hoping it would lead to good luck in their marriage. According to legend, if a bride threw a penny onto his grave and it landed on heads, their marriage would be happy, and the new couple would be blessed with a healthy marriage and children. If the coin landed on tails, well, you probably should go get a good attorney. Though, through the years, admirers of the founding father kept the tradition alive and people still lay coins on Franklin's grave to this day. The Franklin grave site right there on the sidewalk, it collects $700, $800 each year, and those funds are rolled into preserving the cemetery, which is a good cause. For the thousands of pennies that get get tossed onto his grave every year, occasionally a few of them find their way back onto Arch Street sidewalk. According to local lore, the founding father has been known to toss a penny or two of people as they're passing by. Now, I've been up there several times working on my Philadelphia book, and I never saw a penny launch itself towards anyone during my time in the graveyard. But I have seen one or two on the sidewalk next to the grave site uh, on multiple occasions. Anyway, uh, I told you before the Philadelphia book is Southern Ghost Stories of Philadelphia. Uh, the St. Louis book is Ghost Stories and Graveyard Tales of St. Louis. Uh, both can be found on Amazon, and they're also available at Barnes & Noble. If you go to a store and they don't have them, ask the manager and they can order them for you. Uh, the books are also on Kindle, and they're free to read if you have Kindle Unlimited. All the books are. Please like the video in the, in the uh, podcast. Be sure to follow us on Facebook. You can find me over at Twitter um, or X. I'm A.T.O. Allen. That's A-T-O-A-L-L-E-N. I drop a lot of interesting ghost stories from time to time or Grey Robin Tales, just whatever I find. Um, something coming up. I'm going to be at Smoky Mountain Terror 
in Johnson City, Tennessee on June 7th. It's going to be a big show, lots of uh, meet and greets with celebrities from horror movies. I'll be there selling books and, and talking to people, shaking hands, kissing babies. It's going to be a good time. So make plans to come by and say hello. So check back next time. I'm going to do another St. Louis story, telling more fun tales I've collected from working on the books. I'll see you then.